Ruby, um, I can start. My name is Ruby. Um, so a few weeks ago, our class was talking about voice. I was curious when you were writing this, were you seizing the voice of like your younger self, or did it just like feel now to like talk about when you were writing? I would say both. Like, you know, I was conscious of this is a teenager, this is not me. But I mean, like, I guess this is kind of diving into some uh, complicated topics right off. But like, it was kind of like Juliet, the character is like almost like this mirrored sort of version of myself, not entirely, but like a, you know, a mirror of me. Like, it's not me. Um, but it is a version of me. And then the teenage version of all of us is different than the version of you that's sitting in this chair right now. Um, so really kind of like tapping into that part of myself that was a past teenager, as we all used to be past teenagers. Um, and going through and thinking about like, is this true to this character? Um, or is this in a more adult insight or comment or thought? So it was deliberate, but also... Uh, I mean, I think that's kind of good for writing in general is letting it do its thing and then going through and checking and making sure line by line, thought by thought, is this true to it, this character of Juliet, the teenager? Where does that one lead us? Who wants to go next? Uh, hi, I'm Drew. Um, I guess kind of a follow-up question to that. Did that voice come naturally to you or like in a first draft, did that voice um, come through or is that something that was sculpted over time through editing? Yes, <laughs> um, like all of the above. And I think, you know, like like teenagers are catty and nasty and Julia in particular, like felt bad about herself and a lot of times when you're critical of yourself you don't like yourself you're not very kind to other people um and so kind of like letting that id almost have a bit of free reign of like haha I gotta be a nasty teenager um in this voice in this character um and sort of so yeah I would say all of the above of that being something that I didn't think about and then later I thought about it um, in terms of like shaping it. And it, it it was very strange. That's one thing that's really weird if you write about yourself, but then fictionalize it is you start to lose track of what actually happened and like what you visualized in your mind, like your memory becomes very blurry. So it's like some of it is things I remember thinking and some things are things I made up. And I know like the now they're like treated as memory in my brain very like I think it was like very much like a weird experience I went through in writing that book of divisions of self divisions of memory and I think that's one reason why I like that box that we call auto fiction as a whole is it's kind of like you're like messing with yourself in an interesting way that I like <laughs> messing with your own thoughts your perception of reality um and I like that What, um, hi, my name is Hannah. I don't know if my voice, if I can be heard. I can um, hear you. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, I was wondering, like, what inspired you to, like, one, like, write in such, like, digestible, like, size chapters and also to include, like, letters from the future? So the little bits, the short chapters, I think is partially just how I want to write. Like, I've always been interested in kind of micro pieces, flash fiction, whatever you want to call it. I like it when I'm reading something and there's a lot of empty space on the page. Um, and I've always been kind of interested in miniature, small, small little things, whether that's poetry or really short pieces of fiction. Um, I also was thinking about it strategically in that what do I want to read? What do other people want to read? Short things. Um, and so I think that's where our attention frame goes. And then I was also just thinking about my own reading habits. Like if I'm reading before bed and I'm reading like a super short chapter, I might keep on going. Um, and a lot of times if I'm starting to get tired and the chapter is really long, I'll be like, okay, I'm just going to put this away right now. Um, and I think that there's something propulsive that happens when it's short. Um, if you think to yourself, well, oh, I'll just have one more. It's so short. Um, so that type of mentality. And again, thinking about our attention span. Like, I don't think the fact that our attention span that we want shorter things is necessarily bad. It's just a change. 
Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think I need to close my email inbox. I will do that now so it doesn't chime. So that as well. And then the letters from the future, like one thing I did not want to do is I did not want to have an adult voice that made sense of things um, because that was something that I kind of felt was lacking from a lot of the books that I read before on similar subject matter. It was a lot of times there was like, this is what it all means and now I am better and this is how I see it now. I wanted the book to be about being a teenager. You're completely overwhelmed. You have no source of context. You're unable to kind of like translate these experience in a logical way. Um, but having nothing there seem bleak like it seemed like overly depressing um and also there were certain things that kind of like organically I wanted to add in this comment of like this is something that happened to me while I was writing this book that feels pertinent or like just kind of like feeling this need to say something um and that need to say something I was like oh that's interesting maybe I'll keep that so kind of as I was writing the book, thinking about like, do I actually need these letters to the future? Do they need to be developed more, less? Kind of playing around with that. And as I got further along, I realized that editors would like that. And that was actually one of the feed pieces of feedback I got when I was um, publishing the book was one publisher. They're like, we really like this, but we want more of the adult version and I, they're going to offer me more money than I actually got. And I sat there and I thought, do I want to do this or do I want to serve what I think the work is? And spoiler, I chose less money, stupid business decision, but I got to publish the book that I wanted to publish as opposed to having money, um, which I have a job for that, I feel like. Um, so yeah, I think it was just kind of like weighing, I do want some context. I do want some insight, but I want to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. I was wondering, um, I feel like we get to know the main character, Juliet, a lot throughout the the um, the novel, but then we also see her do like some pretty bad things. I was wondering if you had like a, a way that you intended the audience to like interpret or understand Juliet, like if she was supposed to be like good or bad or like somewhere in between in your eyes? I think I'm always interested in like kind of moral ambiguity. Um, like I don't think it's useful to have your neat little heroine who you're rooting for, especially when you talk about things like mental illness or substance abuse. And there's all of those thoughts of am I a bad person or did I just do a bad act? And we all are, right? we all are not like good people or bad people. We all do good things and we all do bad things. Um, so that, and like, you know, mental illness and substance use make us do things that we are not proud of. Um, and that is not anything to be ashamed of. Like, you know, I think if you go to enough therapy or work through 12 step groups, you realize that that's part of your history. It makes you who you are today. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I was also like concerned with the context of the 90s when I grew up, which is you had like a very weird media landscape and like a very strange, I don't know what the parameters may be, I don't know exactly the right word, in terms of things like body shaming, in terms of gender, in terms of appearance in the media, um, and I didn't want to be heavy handed in that or didactic of like, it was so screwed up in the 90s. Um, but uh, that was something that I wanted in there was like, this was very much like, I do think that like my struggles were a product of their time, at least to a certain extent, um, the time and then also the location of Southern California, which is materialistic, everybody acts like everything's great all the time. Um, so kind of like thinking about the cultural forces that shaped who I was, that shaped Julia in return. Um, and yeah, and I think just being interested in like unreliable narrators, narrators who are not good people. I've always liked that type of thing, reading about that type of thing myself, being able to relate to someone who you might not necessarily like, or being able to like someone who you're like, I don't like that thing about you. And I think that's useful for life too, which is you can have friends or whatever, any sort of relationship where you don't like this thing about that person, but that doesn't mean you don't love them or like them as a whole. And I think that that's something we're kind of lacking in society in general is this very 
this person's bad as opposed to like this particular belief I don't like about that person or something like that. So I don't know if that, did I answer your question or did I just kind of, okay. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> <great question. laughs> I think I saw Miley in there. <clears throat> um, hi, my name is Miley. Um, I was wondering, because uh, for what you talk about, I don't know how much of this is true to life. Uh, you did mention that uh, you drew you drew some of um, the content from memories. Um, I was wondering if you had to sort of distance yourself from yourself in order to publish the book, to write the book, and kind of, um, you know, what that vulnerability looks like when put into a public setting. Yeah. I mean, I have often thought that there is something wrong with me. <laughs> like, I do think that, like, I have, like, this, like, emotional masochism where it's, like, if something's uncomfortable, then I want to do that more. Um, like, I was going through, it was a anti-racist training for an organization that I volunteer for, and the woman who was facilitating it said that I can promise you that we will do this in a safe way, but you're not going to feel safe the whole time. And I was like, yes, that sounds awesome. Like suddenly I'm way more interested than I was about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, so I do think that there's some sort of part of me that for some reason likes being emotionally uncomfortable is drawn to that, particularly in writing. I think perhaps that that's my, the same instinct that led me to destructive behaviors like cutting and drugs. Um, and now that's like translated in a more healthy way of let's torture myself emotionally as opposed to physically. Um, so like kind of taking, you can't take the cutter out of the person, but you can take that urge to cut and put it into something healthier. Um, like, I think I do have like, kind of like that addict living inside of me. And now that addict gets to write as opposed to kill themselves slowly, sometimes quickly. Um, so there is that. And it was like a very strange experience. And I think like, I don't like the idea of writing as therapy. Like I always kind of bristle about that when people say like, oh, is this therapeutic for you? Um, because that seems a little bit insulting to me of I'm not writing this as therapy. I go to therapy for therapy, but I do think that there was a therapeutic benefit to it. Um, I think there was the opposite of the therapeutic benefit as well, like that kind of masochism ruminating, but it was side kind of benefit of me looking at this teenage girl who did a lot of the exact same things that I did and seeing her as someone who is sick and suffering and doesn't have the resources that she needs. Um, and being able to kind of forgive that part of myself. Um, and then as I was publishing the book, I was like, I think I need to go back into therapy because I don't go to therapy regularly anymore. Um, and I was like, I think I need to go to therapy. I think I need to like deal with this teenage stuff from an adult perspective, because if somebody's asking me at this at like a book festival or an interview, I cannot start crying. Like that would be really <laughs> weird and uncomfortable for everybody. Um, so I went to therapy for about, I don't know, six months, something like that. And we just kind of worked through that. Um, and so now I have had a book that put me into therapy. I like to joke about that. <laughs> Um, and I don't know. So it was like equal parts felt destructive, felt like a safer place, a better place to channel that destructive energy. Um, and then also some genuinely like positive things that came from it as well. Hi, I'm Barbara. Um, I have more of a technical question kind of going back into the um, structure of the book. I'm curious. Now that you like mentioned flash, flash fiction and after some conversations we had in class, what was the chronology or process, I guess, of writing and then putting the book together? Um, like, did you write any of the, the books within the book first? Was it, did you write it in the order that it's in or what was that like? Um, yeah. Yeah, I roughly wrote it in chronological order of each part. Um, I mean, it changed a lot from what it originally looked like the first draft to what it ended up being. It got a lot shorter and certain things were added or condensed or things like that. Um, I actually envisioned it originally as like even being choppier than it was. Like I thought it was going to be like super short little bits. I think one thing that happened that was strange is I got to be a better writer than I was at the beginning. I guess it's not that strange, but 
I wasn't expecting that. Um, I felt like with the stories that I'd written before, I knew how to do that micro size. And in the process of writing Juliet the Maniac, I learned how to expand a little bit. So that was cool. Like, it's always nice when you're like, ooh, I'm a better writer than I used to be. Um, so there was that. And did I, I feel like there's something to your question I missed. Um, no, I feel like that kind of covers it. Okay, okay. Maybe yeah. there's just something I was going to say, and I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have another question. How did you decide what to, well, what to include? Was it like everything that you could remember or think of? Or were there some things where you kind of went back and forth on? Like, um, yeah. I think that's one of the difficult things about writing fiction that's based in reality is there's what's important to you and then what serves the work and you kind of have to sit there and weigh it um and you know just I think that's one reason why I got shorter is like what can I cut what does not need to be her um what can I condense or what because that was another thing was once you get to the boarding school, you have so many characters mm -hmm. and how are you going to make this realistically populated, but also not overwhelming. Um, so weighing out like, can I condense these people? Can I eliminate this person? Um, was a lot of it. So just kind of logistic stuff of deciding did it need it to be in the book or not. And I think thinking of things of characterization and a narrative arc of a book that was another thing I had wanted to do is I didn't want the traditional plot structure in the book uh, you know like that plot structure diagram I'm sure you can all at least envision partially and I did not want that so I had like this weird line that I had drawn that I wanted the plot structure to follow and it kind of looked like a cardiogram I think I froze up for a second, but the, it was thinking this weird cardiogram of going up and down. And so choosing events and feelings that would keep that cardiogram there, that weird plot structure that I made up for myself that for some reason felt important to follow. That's it, really interesting to hear because I can totally see that now, but I wouldn't have necessarily like, yeah, yeah, that it had like way more arcs than a, than a one arc. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of a funny thing, too, of being like, not one suicide attempt. She needs two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what else are we curious about? Yeah, I guess when I was reading, or, hi, I'm Ari. Um, and when I was reading, I was surprised um, at how sort of quickly and resolutely the diagnosis came. Um, and that seemed like something that there was quite a bit of build up to, and then it happened and then was moved on from. So I was wondering if that's like a reflection of kind of how you felt about it, like um, why that was included in the way that it was so early on um, in, the, in the novel. I think that that is something that can happen, which is you go to a psychiatrist and you get correctly diagnosed. It is rare, but it does happen. And I'm lucky because it happened to me. Like sometimes I feel extremely grateful that my bipolar disorder was so dramatic because it meant I got diagnosed correctly right away as opposed to being diagnosed with something like borderline personality disorder, ADHD, or many of the other diagnoses that get misdiagnosed um, between each other. So I had like a very textbook case of bipolar disorder. Um, and I went to a doctor and they gave me the diagnosis and it was the right diagnosis. And then I got on the treatment. So I thought that that was interesting because the majority of the people that I've known did not get diagnosed that easily. They got misdiagnosed to something or another um, and have had different diagnoses that they tried on. And, you know, that was part of my experience, um, finding that interesting about myself and also kind of cool, something that I felt fortunate about. And I do think that I wanted Juliet to have a set of traits that were going for her in terms of her mental health, as well as a set of things that were against her. Um, and that for that to be relatively accurate to what I actually experienced. Because um, I think that's one thing that's troubled me throughout life is I got better. I'm not like normal now, but I'm better. And a lot of the people that I've known have died or not gotten better. 
um, and being able to, you can't understand the difference. And some of the things make sense, like class or race or gender or certain characteristics I have it within myself in terms of being able to get help. Um, but some of them are just like straight up circumstance of like, I had textbook bipolar disorder, so I was able to get treatment earlier. And I think also wanting to gloss over it because for me, it was like an answer. It was a way to feel better about myself. Well, I wasn't bad. I didn't have like some sort of evil thing living inside me. I just had a disease. Um, and I think that diagnoses can be for some people kind of liberating, not for everybody, um, but for me it was. Um, I guess a follow-up question. Um, did you feel nostalgic about this time in your life? I know that it, you went through a lot of hardships, but I know like sometimes that is still possible to feel nostalgia or like there was something sort of beautiful in the chaos, that sort of feeling. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like I feel grateful that I grew up in the 90s, which I didn't like realize at the time. Like at the time I was like, oh man, people growing up in the 60s, it seems so much cooler in the 70s. Um, but sorry to the youth of America, 90s seem like way better to grow up in. <laughs> but maybe I'm just old and maybe I'm just like think that my time was better. Um, so I do think I feel kind of like nostalgic for the pop culture elements of the 90s. You're messed up, but I don't know, it was simpler. I don't like the commercialization now. So yeah, definitely nostalgic when it comes to pop culture stuff. Um, as far as the other things, I mean, I think romanticizing difficult times is a struggle for anyone, particularly if you use substances, um, thinking that those were the good times, that was the fun times. And you don't want to fall into that trap, I don't think, in literature, nor in just regular old life. Um, so trying hard to not romanticize. But there's certain, like, things I think of, like, when I think of that boarding school that I went to, and I am just, like, so grateful they happened to me. And sometimes it's just, like, I would love it if I could, like, go Zoom back in time and be that 16-year-old girl again for a day. Maybe not nine months, but a day um because there were certain things that happened in there that were just like really intense and awesome and beautiful and I think that's also one of the things about teenagerhood and one reason why I wanted to write a book about the from the perspective of a teenager is adolescence is so heightened like we are experiencing a lot of these things for the first time a lot of times we don't know how to conceptualize them and I think that if you bring substances and mental illness into that it, it's even more so um so it was something I thought about of like I don't want to fall into that trap of nostalgia but there are good things there and I wanted people to be able to see that that it wasn't all bad there's beautiful stuff too um hi I'm Jaden um I would like to ask about like the parent characters in the book kind of how you decided what they would be like, how you um, wanted to make the mom and dad distinct, and then also just what purpose they served in the narrative. I wanted them to be similar to my parents because I felt like my parents tried, they just didn't understand. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with where we were in terms of mental health treatment, which is bipolar disorder, it was not something that you just knew about. Like, I feel like now just the general culture understands vaguely what that means, if not specifically. Um, you didn't talk about your therapist. You didn't talk about any of that stuff. And so I wanted the parents to be sort of like my parents in that they tried, but they're just kind of where we were was limited. Um, and so wanting them to be well-intentioned, but not great. And I think that's like what my parents did. They tried, but the results weren't that great. And they did everything they could um, in order to get me the help that I they needed. And I did want kind of like the two suicide attempts because it wasn't like they just threw me in a boarding school, boarding school in quotes. Um, they tried other stuff first. And so just kind of like parents doing their best. And I think there's something beautiful in that in humanity in general, which is 
sometimes we really suck at stuff, but we're doing our best. And there's something like, I don't know, admirable or cute in that. Um, so wanting that in there. And I don't know, I think maybe there's like a little bit of resentment. I think I've made the mother character softer and then the father character. And I think like maybe I do have some like annoyance of my dad that doesn't exist towards my mom. So maybe I was being a little bit meaner to my dad. He did call me more than my mom did. He's like, does this really happen? And I was like, mm, no. no. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but I didn't want, like I love my parents very much they've been very supportive to me I didn't want to be mean to them but I also just kind of wanted to show what they were lacking what did you get from that you guys did because that's one thing I'm always interested in is what other people thought of the parents what they got from those parents that's just to open to anyone yeah Barbara go ahead we then, talk, yeah we talked about this um during one of our discussions quite a bit and they had disagreements we're like I feel like I I felt about like the way I felt about the parents in the book or is kind of what you're describing now because like I I feel like what like with my context I kind of understand that where like you get when people are like trying not quite getting there but it's like not ill-intentioned whereas some people in the class I think were a bit harsher on the parental figures in the book and they thought that they were like that sometimes like like when Juliet comes back and like she was like soaking in the rain having like the worst day of her life her parents really don't even like ask like oh like what happened they just kind of ask her if she wants to go to dinner with them that was one specific scene where I was like I didn't really flinch at it but some people like had other thoughts and they're like this is so bad <laughs> yeah so there were I think varying opinions in the classroom about these characters I don't know if someone yeah would, yeah Rachel do you I was going to say, um, I think that it's easier for us reading it like today to be more critical of the parents because like the way that like we talk about, like you were saying, the way that people talk about mental health and like the way that like parents, a parent today would like help their child who's dealing with mental illness is probably different than like 30 years ago. Um, so like, I think that reading it today, like my perception of like what a parent might do for their child who's struggling with this type of stuff is different than how it would actually happen. So I was like, oh, these like they're not doing a good job, but I guess like the time frame is like an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, like that's one thing that just kind of blows my mind is that like my uncle and my grandmother were both bipolar disorder and they had it much, much worse than me. And I think about how lucky I am to have been born in when I was, because um, I get to have a functional life, which my grandmother and my uncle did not. Um, but it was kind of the dark ages. Like they did not know so much and just like how many drugs they gave me and what drugs they gave me. We have made so much progress. We still have like, I don't, you know, you guys probably know firsthand that we still are pretty not good at treating mental health, um, but we've gotten a lot better. And I do think it would be completely different, um, ideally, hopefully, um, if this happened today, as opposed to in the nineties. I also think like parenting is really hard. <laughs> um, like, especially when you have a situation like that where there's like, there's no right thing to do. Um, like one of my friends, her son is 20 and he's very bright and is having issues of his own. And it's not like there's a right thing for her to do. And she's a single mom too, of like, what do you do when your kid is doing this thing? There's not a correct answer here. There's try this. If it doesn't work, try this other thing. Um, so just kind of like showing the helplessness of being a parent too, maybe now that, cause I'm a stepmom and I haven't so far, they're young enough that we haven't had anything super tough come up, but there's just like certain moments where you just feel super powerless and can't find the right answer. Yeah. And I feel like we see that a lot around the Juliet character suicides, like the, the, like I felt like compassion definitely for the parents in those scenes where I'm like that's yeah the, the worst thing for a parent right like, yeah like like the seriously the worst thing that you could do to a parent and like that's something I had a lot of guilt over but even like I, one thing I think of when I think of my stepkids getting older like probably they're gonna have problems just like genetically loaded not my genes fortunately but my husband's aren't much better and neither are his ex-wives um, <laughs> and what would I do and like I don't think I would be perfect like even though I have 
gone through this, I'm sure I would make plenty. And it's really scary to think about in terms of like, how do you deal with this type of thing? Can't. Um, I was just I was just gonna follow up about the parent thing. I kind of had a similar um, reaction to Barbara just in terms of like it it just seemed very real and authentic and, and I did kind of get the vibe that they were they meant well but in a lot of situations like didn't necessarily act like how Juliet would have wanted them to or like someone in Juliet's shoes would have preferred. But um I kind of have a similar question to to that one it was more broadly like how people in your life that sort of knew there were characters somewhat based on them like but in addition to your parents you could include them too but like just kind of how they reacted to whether their portrayal itself or like just the fact that they were portrayed or just just kind of how you went about navigating the feedback I got was surprisingly positive. Like I did not, knock on wood, get a single person who was mad at me. Um, it was all people who under, like my best friend at the time, I know that reading that book for her was really emotional. Um, I suspect it was for some other people who I am less close, but I know that read the book. Um, but I was kind of shocked. Like I, generally, if you write about people they don't like some element of it. And maybe if you're a writer, you understand what's going on. So you don't care that much, but oftentimes people who aren't writers don't like it. Um, but for some reason, maybe they're just being nice. <laughs> I don't know, but nobody had any sort of like negative thing about it. I did have to change quite a bit um, from a legal perspective, which was interesting. I didn't know that, that that was gonna come up. So I had to make things obviously not the people and the places that they were that was a kind of a last minute thing to the book that I didn't realize was going to happen <laughs> so like, like, you, like your editor or somebody at the publishing house was like these are things you could get sued for yes yeah huh. so you were still able to keep it I mean obviously it's still like in the same area but like you had to change specific names yeah, and I could not make a Misha suddenly become a Masha or something like that. Right, 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 right. Like, you had to do a little more than that. Yeah. Okay. So if they originally had blonde hair, suddenly it became dark or something along those lines. Oh. Oh. Rachel. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned, like, your husband and his ex-wife. We read the Sarah book, and I was wondering what you thought of the Sarah book. <laughs> I love it's my favorite book that Scott has written. I love it. And I don't, it's like not that difficult for me to deal with the fact that it exists at all. I think like part of it is just you get older and you're like, yeah, he had a different life before we met, so did I. Um, and I don't know, we've had like a very nice relationship, his ex-wife and myself are like a very drama free. I'm grateful that she was married to Scott because she gave me the stepkids that I love and I don't have to be a full-time mom because I don't want to do that, but I want kids in my life. So it's like perfect for me. So thank you, Sarah, for giving me those two amazing stepkids. <laughs> and I don't know, like, I, I think that book is hilarious and heartbreaking and smart and weird. And all of the things that I love about Scott are like present in that book. And I think it's like a very fearless book. And I always feel jealous of his writing and he claims he feels jealous of me. And I think that's nice when you're just like, oh, you're my favorite writer and I'm married to you. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, Ruby. Um, I'm curious, do you ever view your life in like binaries where it's like the version of you that has been healed and like uses the healthier coping mechanisms you're talking about versus like that younger version of you? Or is it more fluid where you like still feel that, that younger version of you? I mean, I think there's different iterations of anybody's self. There's the version of you in college and the version of you that is going to be after college. Um, and I would say that like being able to distinguish between all of them and still have some sort of like connection with all of the versions of yourself is just healthy um and so it is sometimes like you like I was having this really strange experience I was visiting San Diego the other week and I was doing research for this nonfiction book that I'm working on and I was going to these parts of my hometown 
that I hadn't been in a while. And I like had that weird feeling where it's like, you're going to, you might run into someone, you know, who lives in this neighborhood, but that person I was thinking I was going to run into was like the teenage version of myself. And I was like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and it was just like, like almost like, I don't know. I, I just wish that time was not a line and maybe it's not, you know, there's those theories out there, but it would be cool if we could go and jump around. I would really like that. Like if you really, if you could be going to do research for your current nonfiction book and you could like walk down the same street and like cross paths with like teenage Julia. Yeah. Yeah. And wouldn't that be crazy? Do you guys ever feel like that? Like you're like haunting yourself. Like you're like in your room and you're like, wow, there's my eight-year-old self can feel the ghost there. I think that's like, like, you know, we're all kind of these different versions of ourselves traveling in the same little paths that we always have. Um, sort of similar or speaking of which do you view like physically do you view Juliet as different from you as a teenager like how does she appear in your mind's eye and is that different from how you imagine your previous self I think like because my natural hair color is pretty light um, and Juliet looks more like me with my fake dark hair. Um, strangely, that's a weird thing, but I think also kind of like almost ghostly, like it's more than a mirror, but not like a full solid human being. So it is like, looks a lot like me, but I don't know. It's hard to like kind of articulate it. And I think it's one of the cool things that you get as a fiction writer is you get to have these experiences that most people don't get and if they do have those experiences then they're called like you're having delusions or <laughs> hallucinations <laughs> and we get to like have these things we get to have like these made up people that exist with us um and I don't know I think like being a writer is really stupid and sometimes I'm like I wish I didn't have this urge it would be so much better if I had the urge to like figure out how to invest money or something like that <laughs> um but other times, like, I think it's like a real gift. Overall, I think it's a real gift to want to be a writer. Yeah. Are you working on any new fiction projects? Yeah, I have been doing some like super short stuff. I just um, found out I'm getting this, another story collection published. So I'm really excited about that. And then I think my first two books are going to be republished and they had wanted me to do some new stuff with that. So I've been doing like really like, um, they call them hybrid type stuff. So flash fiction-y, prose poem-y stuff. And that's been fun. I haven't done anything like that in a while. And it feels very low pressure, low stakes. I would like to write another novel that's sort of like the updated version of Julia. I'd like it to be based on the portion of my life where I had a horrible manic episode as an adult who was doing all the things you're supposed to do that was like a very magical terrifying part of my life very humbling also like put really important stuff like the groundwork for that like Scott and moving here and writing Juliet the Maniac and writing my other books so I'd like to write that as a novel but mostly it's just been short stuff So like adding, going back to your first book and like, like adding things in. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the, I haven't signed anything. I haven't signed anything on purpose, but um, t combining those two works, Witch Hunt and Black Cloud, and then adding a few new things in there too. And I had told them, I don't want to do short stories. And they were like, how about hybrid stuff? And I was like, yes, that sounds super fun. Right. Right. One of them, I'll just, um, is about 9-11 because I have this strange fascination with 9-11 that like Scott gets so sick of me talking about 9-11. And so it's about 9-11. It's like cool. I, cool is not the right word. 9-11 is a tragedy, but they're cool facts about like horrible things that happened on 9-11 that I'm so interested in because they're so terrible. And for some reason, I love to trouble myself. <laughs> so that's so one of the things. Can, yeah, you can put it there instead of like, bothering Scott with it. <laughs> yes, instead of babbling monologue style. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, this isn't a question. Just please write the like updated like maniac yeah. version. I really want to read that. Just to <laughs> just comment out there. It's good to know that you have some like some readers ready for. I really want to write it. The thing was that like that book was such a pain to write. Like I didn't think I really realized like how emotionally attached I would be to it. Um, and I was like, I need something that I care less about in between. And so, yeah, maybe by the time I get to that book, I'll learn how to not be so like Gollum ish about it. <laughs> you are particularly hard though. Like it's like, I mean, speaking from my perspective, like it's really hard to let go of a novel anyway, but I've never written a novel that was based off of like a really intense part of my life. So that just seems like extra. Yeah, it felt unhealthy. I was just like, I, I want to do this again, but not right now. <laughs> yeah. Miley? Um, you mentioned a while ago, like a desire to write. Um, did you, have you always had that? Like, did you have that when you were um, this age or how did that progress throughout your life? Yeah, I started keeping a journal when I was, I don't know, five, like that thing you can barely read because I didn't really know how to write yet, but it exists. Um, and then I started writing poetry in, I don't know, junior high. And then it's strange. Like I didn't have this recollection. I thought that me wanting to be a writer was like this thing that just somehow happened in my twenties, but then actually going through, like I was doing research on myself, but going through and like finding these old documents and I was like, oh, I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. And I wanted to be a writer when I was a teenager. And somehow I like blocked this out. I think for a long time, I like didn't really give myself permission to be a writer. Like I thought I wasn't good enough. Um, so, but yeah, apparently it's been my whole life. But for some reason, I strangely blocked that off. Weird. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. I'm curious how you chose the two quotes at the beginning of the novel. I kind of thought that the book needed a certain amount of context in order for it to make sense. People don't like things when you are basing them in reality and then you mess with them to fictionalize them. People get confused when it says Julia, Juliet in the cover and the character is named Juliet. Um, people make a big deal about autofiction. People have certain ideas about autofiction, about teenage girls, about all this stuff. So I wanted something that kind of like grounded the reader. Um, one of them more pretentious than the other and kind of like that fine line of art and pop culture blending together. Um, Marilyn Manson, you know, now has accusations that did not exist things have come into light that did not exist, probably wouldn't choose that now. Um, but at the same, at that time, it was like edgy teen, kind of corny mall goth. <laughs> and I liked that, uh, you know, contrast between the two of corny mall goth and something more literary and traditional. So like between the two, I was hoping to, I don't know, give some sort of context to the reader. Yeah. What kinds of books do you like to read? Um, similar stuff oftentimes is what I like to write. I enjoy a good nonfiction book. I enjoy a good NPR book. And what I mean by that is like a nonfiction or a novel that like a middle-aged woman would like. Like Jonathan Franzen's most recent book, loved that. Um, don't really understand why I loved it so much, but I super did. And then, but I would say my favorite books are like oftentimes the ones that my friends write. I think that I am lucky to have super talented friends. And uh, I think that one reason why I'm friends with them is they're interested in the same sort of things that I am, which is just kind of artistry, emotional intensity, experimenting with form, experimenting with what writing can do, um, a certain boldness too. I'm looking at you, Misha. <laughs> 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 we'll get a couple more minutes anything else I also can tell you I have been reading this book right let me make sure I get the um 
Okay, it's called Strangers to Ourselves by Rachel Aviv. I've been reading this the last few nights, and it is amazing. It's like the best book I've read in a while. It's nonfiction. It's about mental illness and kind of like how society views it and how society views it, how it changed, how the mental illness manifests. And it is so good. It is like very saying very complicated things about mental illness, stuff that I've never thought of before. It's really well-researched, really smart, well-written, and I'm very impressed with it. I'm about halfway through, so maybe it'll get bad, but I'd recommend that book for sure. Even like just the first half being as great as you were describing, it's like pretty good for a, mm. for a lot of books. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like the thing, the new thing that I have read in a while that has really impressed me. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how much, if any, of the of this book felt confessional. <laughs> Good question. I mean, I think confessional has like a lot of like loadedness to it. There's a weight to it, especially when you talk about women, especially when you talk about teenage girls, especially when you talk about drugs, like all of those, there's like that kind of, I don't know, stigma is not the right word, baggage, um, a way of dismissing somebody's experiences or somebody's work because it deals with those things. It's confessional, um, as though confessional is a diary type deal, something you do with therapy. Um, that is also something I like in writing. Like if something is described as confessional, I want to read it. I do love gossip. That's one thing I'm not necessarily super, super stoked about myself, but I love gossiping. And I think confessional is part of that. I like kind of like that soap opera-y thing to it. And I think that teenage girls, drugs, they do have that element to them. Um, so kind of being aware of that as I was writing it, liking that label, disliking that label, wanting to fall into that label, wanting to push against that label. So I would say it was like something I was definitely aware of throughout the process and wanting to go along with it and also buck against it and feeling like I like this. And I also am kind of pissed off that this label exists and is attached to these things. Um, so I don't know about how much, but it was definitely kind of like something dangling over my head as I was working on it, thinking about it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, no, you don't have to be sorry. Yeah. And why did you dedicate it to Scott? Because he was who I was writing it for. I mean, I think, number one, I was writing it to myself, but that would be really bad if you're like, to myself. <laughs> 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 Um, but I was, he was like my ideal audience, the person that I wanted to impress. I wanted him to be proud of me. He was also the one who was the most important reader to me, the person who had to deal with me, like freaking out over it for years. Cause that's what happens when you write a book is you freak out over it for years. And then your partner, your friends, or all of them get to deal with you having these stupid crises that you made up. Um, and you know, I just feel like our writing lives are very intertwined. And that's something nice. So yeah, it really is kind of for him. Um, I would say it's to my parents too, but also that's kind of messed up of like, here's this book I wrote about your parenting failures in a way, <laughs> the worst part of your life that I gifted to you. Um, so yeah, if it was entirely accurate, it'd be like to myself, also to Scott and my mom and dad. And that wouldn't have worked out too well. Oh, and I was also joking that I was going to dedicate it to our dog. <laughs> Because that would have made Scott really mad. <laughs> yeah, Anna. Um, I okay. Two questions. The first one. Um, I was thinking about like, like, like your use of like music throughout the text, right? Or like, I and I just really identified very heavily like with like that sort of like cultural like moment kind of thing. And I was just wondering like, how did you choose to like where to put in music or like bands or how to make it the size that it was or make it bigger versus the smaller or whatever. I, I mean, like where it felt natural and like where I had actual like associations with songs, like I didn't want to, you know, insert it where there wasn't anything, but I mean, I like music, teenagers especially like music, um, or at least I did when I was a teenager. I don't know how teenagers are now. 
Um, and so we just wanting it kind of like organic that way. And then I think like when I was in MFA school, there was like this weird, I don't know if people still do this in MFA school, but there was this weird conversation about how like you shouldn't have pop culture references because it dated things and like it wasn't good and it wasn't timeless if you put those in there and me just kind of being like, that's wrong. You guys are dumb. I'm putting pop culture references in my work. Um, so a little bit of like sassiness child childish sassiness wanting to put it in there but mostly like like you know like that part in the van like that actually happened listening to Metallica driving down the road very good memory that Metallica if that's not in there then that memory is not complete um so certain moments where the music like actually mattered and I think uh I don't know I've always been obsessed with music videos or growing up I was obsessed with music videos and wanting music video type elements. I had sort of forgotten about what you just said, but it, there was a period of time where there was a very large conversation about like, don't include like overly specific like references to things, which always annoyed me, but also now seems just kind of crazy. Like, like because what then the piece, I don't know, but like maybe what would you all think? Like before Google was a thing. So like maybe, and, you um, know, I'm reading this book now and there's something I don't understand. I can look it up and then right. I immediately know the context. Right. But I don't know when y'all were in school, but like I'm sorry, that's on no 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 no. <laughs> Not as like why it's so well that like it's so common to the history. What's this? Right, 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 right. right. No, I do think that maybe maybe you're right on that because like I mean I guess this is the question of you like we have read th th like this book but also other things um in this class that like definitely reference things that I assume are not like extremely familiar to you. Does that like make you? want to stop reading which is I guess presumably what these people's argument was or or they thought it made it like less like I always just thought it was so dumb because yeah. if you read a book from the 1600s or whatever there's going to be cultural reference like this is right. I just thought it was stupid yeah. but I do think that MFA like it would be cool if somebody did a book of like the different waves and rules that MFAs right. came up with because right. I, I got my MFA in 2009 to 2011 and that era of what was desirable in literature is very different than it is now. And right. it was its very own particular version of annoying. Right, right, right. There are probably new weird rules now. Yeah. Like well, I mean, I read a lot of romance books. And yeah. sometimes there are, because they are contemporary novels, there's references that, like, are happening now. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, like, casually, like, mention TikTok. And it just oh. completely oh. takes me out of the book. Okay. The novel. Yeah. I think there's a bad way to do it. Like, there's the 9-11 novel. There's going to be, and there already is, the COVID novel. Right. Um, I think when people are, like, trying to be timely, it doesn't work. Right, like maybe that's a different part of it is like trying to be, like there's like timeless and timely. Mm -hmm. And that maybe if you're like trying too hard to be either one of those, then like it's not like, cause I always feel like, like I feel like the music and, and references in your book are like, um, they're part of what makes the world that is like, it is like very obvious that we are not reading about like 2022, yeah. right? And like, that's a good thing. Like you created a very full world. And that's, um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm hopefully you all knew what Metallica, like, I've at least heard of Metallica. I'm still hoping for that. Maybe not like all musical references, um, but like, yeah, as, as Jaden said, you can just look it up too. Yeah. And then, also, one thing that I want to say that I think is so funny is one of my Goodreads reviews. I try not to read those, but sometimes you have to because um, you feel the need to. You feel the need to trouble yourself that way. One of the Goodreads reviews said that it was not realistic that it was in the 90s because they did not have Calvin Klein jeans. And I was like, that is the dumbest criticism I've received thus far. Have you never heard of Kate Moss and that campaign? So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there are certain things that are kind of like, like I have, like with one of my novels, the, the um, copy editor was like, there was, there were like slot machines. And she was like, this slot machine did not exist in 1989. And I was like, oh, okay, that's good to know. Like, fine. <laughs> I'll, I will like change that. Right. Like it doesn't really matter. And I was like, all right, like maybe that would bother somebody. Um, but yeah, but, but Calvin Klein jeans did exist. Like, yes, that was like a huge component of my 
junior high world. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I guess it just, it's, if the book depends on something that's not comprehensible. Maybe. But yeah. Yeah. But, yes. Depending um, on it is not. Yeah. And I had another question. So we've talked a little bit about books kind of as an object outside of the author once they're published and how the author has to deal with the fact that the book is no longer theirs in a way. Um, and so I was wondering if there are people who you don't want to read this, like, for instance, how you would feel if your stepchildren read it and how once you publish it, it's out of your control. So what what you think about that? I just, I don't, like, I try to separate my work self and my writer self as much as I can. I don't want my students reading it. Um, some students totally fine, but I live in Southern West Virginia, lots of conservative church people. They don't need to know the terrible things I did and the terrible language that I used. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who I don't. I, my stepkids, I, I kind of do hope they'll read it at some point. I hope that they're older, like a lot older. Um, I don't really they might have read it and just like not told me because they know better. I don't really want my in-laws reading it because they know a very different version of me and, you know, they know what I've been through, but I don't want to hor horrify them either. They don't need to know the details. Yeah. They don't need to know the details. The whore that their stepdaughter is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any last minute things we want to say or ask or anything? Well, I just want to say it's not a question, but I really enjoyed um, your book. And Thank you. Yeah, I thought, I thought it's been one of my favorite reads throughout the semester. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And we're super grateful um, for you making the time to Zoom with us. Yeah, this is really fun. I appreciate all your guys' thoughtful questions. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. You all take care. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.